and he says that people don't actually uh, recognize him when he appears without it. Uh, it is a little bit disconcerting, so it's good to see that he has the hat on in his picture here. Um, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about smart logic, uh, a little bit about the concept of content intelligence. Um, then Tom is going to introduce CAPS Group, and he's going to talk about uh, what text analytics is and give us some examples of uh, actual use of text analytics to drive business value for organizations. Um, we have all microphones muted at this point. If you have questions, we would encourage you to type them into the question box in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. We will get to as many of those questions during the broadcast as we can, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, answer any additional questions by follow-up emails. So, when I think about content intelligence, what I think about is the fact that 80 to 90 percent of the information in organizations, and in fact most of the human intelligence in organizations, is, um, is locked away in, in content. It's in PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint files, documents, contracts, um, project summaries, and so on and so forth. Um, Gardner has said that organizations that integrate high-value, diverse, and new information types into a coherent information management infrastructure will outperform their industry peers by more than 20%. We believe that the ability to unlock the value in content is the untapped frontier of competitive advantage. It is the thing that is going to allow organizations to become more competitive in, in the 21st century. Uh, we've got a pretty good handle on what we're doing with structured data at this point, but un unstructured information to most organizations is still um, a bit of a mystery. And when we talk about it at Smart Logic, we typically talk about it in terms of the fairy tale. Okay, once upon a time there was paper. People did business on paper. Uh, they sent you purchase orders in the mail or over a fax machine. Things got filed away in filing cabinets. Um, uh, people uh, wrote out invoices by hand or, or typed them out and, and sent them through the mail. Checks came in the mail and so on and so forth. And then sometime in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, Somebody got the really bright idea of taking some of that information and putting it into a structure that would allow it to be automated. And so we had this thing called a hierarchical database. And hierarchical databases were great because they allowed you to, um, to automate uh, the, the production of invoices. They allowed you to automate the accounting for checks that were paid in and so on and so forth. But they had some significant shortcomings because you couldn't understand the data unless you looked inside the program to see what the data meant. So um, those of you who are as old as I am will remember uh, COBOL programs where you had whole sections of the program that were defining what the data meant. And so if you actually needed to make a change to the data, you actually had to go gin yourself up a, pro a COBOL programmer in order to be able to do that. So that was a step forward, and then in the 1970s, 80s, we had a shift change. And what happened was we started to take this data and make it self-describing. And we put it into a structure called a relational database. And relational databases were great because you could basically ask the database, uh, tell me what your data is about, and it would say, well, bytes 1 through 25 are the customer number, and that's alphanumeric, and bytes 26 through 43 are the customer's name, and so on and so forth. So you could actually have multiple programs using the same information because the data itself would tell you what it's about. And that actually led to a whole explosion of innovation. We got uh, data warehouses. We got business intelligence to sit over the top of the data warehouses so that uh, executives could actually look into the data. 
Um, we've now reached the next, next generational shift with the structured information in, in what we call the post-relational data stores, the NoSQL databases that actually allow us um, to uh, define less, uh, to have more uh, freedom around, around the structure of the information because one of the major drawbacks of the relational database was that you actually had to presuppose the question and structure the information in a way that the question should be answered. So the big promise of the post-relational data stores is that because they are schemaless or schema agnostic, you no longer have to uh, presuppose the question, but you actually have a lot more freedom. Uh, to ask any kinds of questions that you like of your data. The big problem with the promise and why it hasn't been received or hasn't been achieved is, is that in the vast majority of organizations are still only using that 20% of the information which was automated way back in the hierarchical and relational database days in order to be able to uh, predict what's happening in their marketplaces and where their information is going. So what was happening with the paper all this time uh, and with the unstructured information? Well, for a long time it stayed on paper and we put it in filing cabinets. Um, and then there was a point where we said, uh, let's take those filing cab cabinets and electronify them, and we turned them into file shares. And then we had a, a brief romance with image management systems, and uh, because nobody could find anything, we invented enterprise search to go over the top of all of that stuff. And then the later innovation was content management systems, which essentially allowed you to uh, structure the unstructured information in uh, a more intelligent way, but they're still document-centric and they're still very hierarchical. If you look at most content management systems today, they are, um, uh, they, they are built on a construct of filing cabinets and folders. And unless you actually open the document and read it, you can't get out the bits of intelligence that are inside. Uh, and that brings us to content intelligence, which actually allows the content to become self-describing. So that in the same way that you could ask a relation database, uh, you know, tell me what your data is about, you can now ask uh, a PDF or a document. And the document will tell you, I am a contract, I am between uh, this company and that company, I cover these services, I cover this range of dates, and so on and so forth. And the ability to make the content self-describing actually allows you to get to the concept of unified enterprise information where you now have all of the information and all of the intelligence in the enterprise that is um, managed under a consistent semantic umbrella and it allows you to uh, gain the insights from all of the unstructured information that you couldn't use up till now. So content intelligence, I originally come from Gartner and at Gartner we all define um, we, all def we like to define things, and so one of the first things I did when I came to Smart Logic was, uh, was create a definition for content intelligence. And basically, it is a con combination of semantic technology and information science. And what it allows machines to do is to model the problem domain, interpret that model in order to create the rules by which information can be classified and described, allows you to describe all of those uh, unstructured information assets, which allows you then to analyze and visualize them in order to leverage the human intelligence that is locked in that content. And the components of Smart Logic Semaphore that do those things are Ontology Server, which manage the models, the rules bases, which actually interpret the models to create rules for classification and extraction. The classification server, which is responsible for attaching complete, consistent, and very rich metadata to those information assets. 
advanced language packs which allow you to do all kinds of analytics and extraction and semantic enhancement server which actually allows you to visualize the results because we all know that people do better with charts and graphs than they do with green bar reports. And with that I'm going to turn it over to Tom to talk about the CAPS group and what they do and to give us some real life examples. Okay, um, thank you, Anne, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I'm going to continue the introduction um, briefly, um, talking a little bit about uh, CAPS Group, um, which is a company I started about 12 years ago. It's a network of consultants um, I put together for different projects. Um, we've been doing this stuff for a long time. We started out with taxonomies. We do faceted taxonomies. Um, applying complexity theory and natural level categories and emotion taxonomies to um, actual business applications. Um, we've been doing almost exclusively text analytics for the last 10 years. So you can see we do a lot of different services. We help people get started. We partner with SmartLogic, um, all the various clients. And if you want to see more, um, you can see the various presentations and articles that I've done um, on the website. And lastly, as, as um, Ann mentioned, I'm the program chair for Tax Analytics World uh, Conference. We just finished a conference um, in March um, in San Francisco and, of course, already getting ready for next year. So enough about that. Um, let's talk about data and tech. So I'm assuming everybody has heard about big data, volume, velocity, and variety. And yeah, there's a little bit of a hype about it, but the reality is it is incredibly important and there's been some amazing applications developed. Um, the big difference between big data and what we're going to be talking about is that um, there are new techniques to access all the amount of data, but the actual data analysis um, is fairly well known. It's traditional methods. Um, it, it works. We know it. it it's very precise. On the other hand, we have something that's even bigger than big data, which is big text. Um, anywhere from 75, we're actually looking at not, close to 90% of valuable business information is in unstructured text. And one of the big jumps, of course, is because of social media. Well, even though big text is much bigger than big data, it's, there's a lot more of it. There's, it's a lot more valuable in a lot of ways. The problem is that these traditional analysis methods don't work um, on unstructured text. And so it sits there being underutilized. And what we're going to be talking about um, for the rest of the, the time today is how to get into big text and get the same kind of value out of that that you get out of big data. So um, how does that all, all work? Well, the basic idea is there's two ways that um, text analytics can help create value out of unstructured text. The first is simple, in a way. You just go in and you extract all the information out of the text, turn it into data, um, you find all the people and the, the, the company names and all the various um, pieces that you bring out as data. Then, then you can just apply traditional data techniques. So that's, that's very valuable. It's one of the big parts of text analytics. On the other hand, there's another part which is even more valuable in a lot of ways, and that is new techniques and technologies that we've developed in text analytics to basically understand the concepts within the text. Um, we can model the various relationships, we can model the concepts and their relationships, and we can develop methods to really understand the text um, in a very deep way. And this is the second part of text analytics. So the two pieces come together, um, and they enable us to create value um, out of unstructured text. So what do we mean by text analytics? Well, um, I know Anne has just talked about how she loves um, to do definitions. Um, and um, Anne and I get along very well on a lot of areas. Um, for me, no. I'm, I'm not so much concerned about defining what text analytics is. I mean, after all, what kind of a definition could cover all the different kinds of things that text analytics does? For example, um, one technique is to treat words as objects and then just apply very advanced mathematical techniques to those, those objects. You can, you can define the patterns of words in documents. And when you do that, um, you can find out some pretty amazing things. Um, and we'll talk about one in a second. Um, in addition, 
Tax Analytics also deals with social media. It analyzes what people are saying in, in Twitter posts and, and um, forum posts, not only what they say, but we try to dive in more deeply and what do they really mean um, behind those, those textual expressions. It also covers things like fraud detection. For example, um, looking at words as objects, um, in, in one case we had a um, keynote speaker at our conference a couple years ago um, that wrote a really great book on the secret life of pronouns. What, what he did was look at patterns of, of words that people normally don't pay attention to, called function words, um, and it turns out that you can, by looking at the patterns of those words, you can actually tell with about 75-80% accuracy whether someone is lying. Um, for example, we, we analyzed the Enron emails to do that. You can tell whether someone is writing an email to someone who is more powerful than them versus less powerful. So there's all different kinds of things you can do with just the patterns of words. But you can also do more deep kinds of analysis. And the, for example, one, one application we're going to talk about a little bit later, you can actually predict um, customer behavior based on the text. Um, another application is duplicate document detection. It doesn't sound particularly exciting or sexy, but the reality is that companies are being swamped by documents that are duplicates that clog up their search results, that, that make it hard to actually use, and much more difficult um, than actual duplicates are near duplicates and trying to figure out what the, the right, the most official version is. Um, so there's text analytics techniques for doing that. Um, there's also text analytics techniques for doing advanced business and customer intelligence. What are your customers saying? What are your business um, um, rivals saying? And then there's also, of course, the, the real heart of text analytics is advanced software using taxonomies and ontologies, um, using library science and cognitive science um, to develop all these applications. So text analytics really covers all these different kinds of things. Um, there's, there's pieces, there's, there's, um, the, there's def definitions that kind of overlap. Um, there's a famous philosopher, Wittgenstein, that talked about um, definitions really um, don't deal with precise um, delimitation of, of, of a concept as, as complex as text analytics, but rather develop something like family resemblances. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, what I'd like to do to give you an idea of what text analytics is all about before we go and dive into some um, actual use cases and see how it's being used in business is I want to talk about what the different fun basic functionality pieces of text analytics are. First one is text mining. Um, that includes NLP, natural language processing, where you actually do define words as, as objects and, and su subjects, and you, you define the different types of words, but you don't actually get into the meaning of words. It's an area that, that has a great deal to do with machine learning and very complex statistics. There's a lot of definitional conflicts probably between text mining mining and text analytics, the reality is they all pretty much go together, um, although they do call for different kinds of skills. But text mining is, is the piece that's most advanced um, in terms of the actual techniques, but it's limited in terms of it's not dealing with the actual meaning of words. Another type of basic functionality is noun phrase extraction. You, you develop catalogs and rules for the software to go in and find all the people names in a document, all the organization names, the dates, the methods, the diseases, disease states, things like that. Um, and then you pull all that out. Um, and as I mentioned, then you can apply various kinds of data techniques to it. Third big area of functionality is sentiment analysis, where you, again you have the software trained to go in and look for positive and negative phrases um, around um, company names, product names, and so forth. Um, this is an area that's already seen a huge hype cycle. Um, we, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Um, they started just looking for big catalogs of positive and negative words. Looked, oh, well, you know, the word love is next to our company, therefore um, they're saying positive things. Well, it turns out the, the first round of sentiment analysis um, didn't work very well. It was written almost just a little bit above chance. Um, we developed since then much more sophisticated techniques um, for really understanding the context around those, those positive and negative phrases. And I'll show you some examples of those um, as we go on. Summarization is another technique where the software will go in and look at uh, like a, a thousand page document and create a, a two or three page summary out of it. And that enables people then to scan information in, in intelligent ways but also not having to read an entire document. 
Um, this is something that's been somewhat underutilized, but it's also something that people are now beginning to, to combine with things like not just creating uh, an abstract summary, but creating a narrative describing um, a document or, or describing the results of uh, anything from a financial analysis to a baseball game. Um, and so people, people's brains are really tuned to stories. We pay attention to stories, we remember stories. And so that's another use um, for this type of summarization. And then there's a whole area of fact extraction where you have ontologies. Ontologies, as a sort of recovering philosophy major, um, I have to admit I was somewhat um, dismayed that, that the word ontology was being taken over um, again. But it, it's OK. You, I, I've gotten over it. But the reality is that ontology is a model, and it consists basically of triples. Um, you have a subject, an object, and a relationship. And that sounds simple, but and it is, but you can create really, really complex uh, models of various kinds of environments. And so the software then can go in and not just extract a single noun phrase, but can ex extract relationships between entities, between companies and people um, and events and so forth. And then the last piece for functionality for text analytics is auto, auto classification. Um, typically, this is, again, based on an ontology or a taxonomy, some kind of a structure. And auto classification, it's, it's somewhat of a misleading word in that it's, the basic functionality can be used for a variety of things, one of which is, is automatically classifying documents. But the reality is that this is the, the real heart of text analytics. This is the brains of the outfit. Um, auto classification the functionality is something that can actually be applied to all the other areas um, of text analytics and make everybody else smarter. So this is the piece that's really the, the heart and the foundation. OK, so enough about abstract definitions and functionalities and so forth. Let's try to take a look at two case studies that we did um, over the last few years to try to make this a little more concrete, a little more specific. OK, the first one um, was for a company called Amdocs, they're a telecommunication service provider. And they provide services to all the telecommunications telecommunications companies. So what they needed to do was to create a platform um, to solve multiple issues and to provide multiple services to their clients. So yes, they looked at categorization. We looked at entity extraction. We looked at center analysis. We also had to look at the different languages. Not everything is written in English. Um, we tend to think it is. But, but there's other languages just as important for business as well, um, particularly for giant companies like telecommunications companies. The content that we were looking at were two basic types. Um, one was customer support notes. Those are notes that customer support reps are, are typing um, while they're on the phone. Um, and we'll talk about what that means later. Um, and then the second piece was social media, um, forums around um, telephone company forums, uh, product forums, um, where people are expressing their opinions, um, discussing uh, various aspects of telecommunications products and services. And one of the key parts of this project was that the scalability issue was such that you know, we were looking at literally millions of documents or fr fragments of documents a day. And so um, we had to come up with a solution that would work for all that. So the basic approach we had to develop was a very deep understanding of the content um, which enables us to build new applications. We're looking at things like, why, why were people calling? What are, what are the different motivations? We actually defined about um, 30 different motivations um, that might prompt somebody to call. We had to look at both direct and indirect sentiment. Um, and we also, this is where we did our first behavior prediction um, project. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. But um, one thing I wanted to mention about the categorization of these, these customer support notes, um, the, again, the scale is such that it re you really need to have a semi-automated or automated solution um, using um, software, um, such the, so the same kind of software, for example, that, that SmartLogic provides. Um, and so this, this was a, a key part of the project. And um, it also meant that these customer support notes not only had huge amounts of, of content, but the, the amazing spelling and grammar, creative uh, spelling and grammar that these customer support notes came up with was truly amazing. Um, 
you have to imagine, this is somebody that they're on the phone, they've got a computer screen in front of them, their customer is screaming and yelling in their ear about they hate this, they don't like this, and they're sitting there typing as fast as they possibly can to take it all down. So you can imagine the kind of spelling um, and errors. So what this meant was, for us, um, is that we had to develop a, a different type of, of te text analytics rules that separated the logic from the vocabulary. And I'll show you an example of that as we go on. But first, I want to show you this. This is just a brief hint of the kinds of variations that we came across. Um, so on the right, you have the department names, um, there are spellings. On the left, different customer um, spellings. Um, now, this is actually only a small part of what we found for customer. And customer wasn't even the worst word. The worst word we came up with for this project was the first 2,000 customer support notes we looked at there were 40 different spellings of the word transfer. So this is not something you can build a little dictionary and, and, and everything works. You have to, you have, to um, have a constantly updated um, sort of list of these creative spellings um, and keep that separate from the logic of the rules. So what were some of the things that we could do once we, we could analyze the customer support notes? Well, one is to say we could, we could develop ways to understand um, the call motivation and figure out how to analyze um, the trends in call motivations and so forth. But the most exciting application was actually predicting um, customer behavior based on these notes. And what they wanted to do was to dis distinguish between people who were calling to cancel um, their entire account versus one account, um, or you know, one phone, you know, but they wanted to do the entire account, um, versus those people who were really just calling to threaten. And to do this, you had to do a pretty sophisticated analysis of the text, but more importantly, the context around text. So the first thing we had to do was look at, is this call about canceling an account and canceling an entire account? And so that was a fairly straightforward text analytics problem. We had to look at all the text words that meant canceling an account, um, and come up with rules to do it. But then the second piece was, does the text also contain what we call bargain words? So what do we mean by that? Well, here's a couple of samples. So in the first one, the customer called to say he will cancel his account. Okay, that's pretty straightforward to find that um, if he does not stop receiving a call from ad agency. Well, there's that bargain word in the middle, if. That bargain word tells you that this person isn't really calling to cancel their account what they're calling to do is to stop getting a call from the ad agency. Same thing in the second example. Um, CCI, by the way, is another spelling for customer. Uh, the customer is upset that they have this charge and wants it off, or, and that's the bargain word, um, they're going to cancel their, their account. And so we developed rules that would look for both the words um, that indicate a canceling account, but also bargaining words um, in relationship to those. So this is the kind of advanced application you can build. All right, second um, application we um, developed for them was, again, social media. And this is something that has been a hot area in text analytics recently, um, the last few years. And as I mentioned before, the, the big issue right now is going to that next generation of social media um, analysis, beyond just simple good and evil, positive and negative. But we want to look at degrees of intensity of emotions, complexity of emotions, and, and complexity of documents. And so one of the ways to do that, you have to look at the context around specific words and phrases. So one of the, the key things to look for are things like rhetorical reversals. I was expecting to love it. So if you've got, um, I was actually the word it, by the way, and, um, that is another problem for text analytics, is you have to do this kind of co-reference um, resolution um, to figure out what the it refers to. But let's say it was, uh, I was expecting to love the, this new camera. Well. If you do a simple text uh, sentiment analysis um, of that and just looking for positive and negative words, you see the word love, you see the word camera, ah, oh, great, um, they love our camera. But the reality is, of course, the next phrase is going to be something like, but I really hate it because it doesn't have this feature or that feature. So you have to do this, this contextual relationship, not just look for words. This involves both categorization and concept extraction to really do well. It also involved using new taxonomies called appraisal taxonomies and emotion taxonomies. So for example, the phrase not very good is made up of three basic components. Um, the word good, and that again, there could be hundreds and hundreds of different words for the word good. Um, and then that, so that's, that's the basic attitude. Then you have the, the qualifier, very, 
um, and that gives you indications for intensity. And again, there's lots and lots of different ways that that very intensity um, can be described. And then the third piece, of course, is the, the negative um, that turns it all completely around. And so um, we had to develop those kinds of models as well. Um, in addition, we actually had to model the users and the communities to a much greater degree um, than um, in other applications. So the social media part was we we're looking at, um, say, forums around telephone usage um, and to figure out what people were saying. One of the things, for example, that you can do with this kind of analysis is not just, you know, are our customers happy or unhappy, but um, what, what exactly are they unhappy about? You can use it to uncover or discover um, you know, potential problems in, in your, your product before they really become um, out of hand um, and take appropriate action before that happens. So that's a fairly common application for social media. So this is an example of a screen, um, for example, looking at um, the words very dissatisfied. As you can see underneath, um, there's lots and lots of, of different words that are um, in that general category of very dissatisfied. And so you can use the software to look at all those different variations. You can also use um, other, other software um, components like looking at, at narrower concepts that aren't, aren't quite the same but, but are, are related. Uh, and so this is the kind of text analytics application screen you would develop your rules on um, to analyze the sentiment. Okay, so um, that's the first use case. And um, since we got a late start, I'm going to try to rush through a lot of this. But um, uh, the second case I wanted to talk about was the, um, a company called Behringer. Um, it's a pharmaceutical company. And what they were looking at were how to get more value out of the scientific journals that they all um, subscribe to. So the problem is that scientists are struggling to keep up with all that literature. Um, there's multiple journal types. There's a variety of formats. Some had metadata, some didn't. All different kinds of subjects and styles. So even though they're all so-called science journals, um, the, actual, the amount of variety was pretty amazing. Um, and of course, at the time, they had a pretty poor search, um, which is not, it's almost kind of redundant. Um, enterprise search is something that's been struggling for many, many years. Um, and they were struggling as well. And what happens, of course, is that because of that bad search, researchers are wasting an enormous amount of time. And even more importantly, they couldn't really use those journals to discover new ideas and build new applications. Okay, so what do we do for them? Well, first step almost always in text analytics is to create a structure. You can call it a taxonomy. Um, you can call it an organizational schema, you can call it, it can be an ontology. There's a lot of different words we can use there. The, the reality is you have to model the domain somehow or other. And in this particular case, um, we actually did what's a very good technique, by the way, in text analytics, which is don't try to build any, anything from scratch if you can beg, borrow, or steal it from somebody else. So um, in this case, we use medical subject headings mesh. We use a subset because it's way too big um, for the kind of categorization that we wanted to do. And this, by the way, also is a general rule. Um, giant taxonomies that are, that are developed in order to index every possible concept in, in documents don't work very well when applied to text analytics. You need to trim them down. You need to, to restructure them. Okay. So, the second piece, we, we developed a way of faceted search application. Again, faceted search is becoming pretty much the standard, um, enabling people to sort by date, by author, by journal, instead of having to, to, to um, refine their query, which, of course, they don't do. Um, and then that, that faceted search is being, that's the one piece that's really made search um, begin to work. The problem with faceted search is it requires an enormous amount of metadata. And so what we did, we built um, entity recognition, entity extraction capabilities to go in and pull all that, those, that information out um, to stick them into the various facets. The facets things were, in this, and what they were interested in were things like species, um, the document, the study type, um, the drug and disease name, adverse events, and so forth. And so once, once the, all those facets were populated using text analytics, then the search could be, um, you, you could develop a search that would really enable people to find what they're looking for by making simple selections out of a facet um, and also using what they already knew about what they're looking for um, in ways that they really don't um, if you have to type out some complex search query. So 
Um, one of the key parts of this particular example was that we used the categorization rules to actually define sections in the document. Now, we talk about unstructured text all the time. The reality is there's no such thing. Now, there is no such thing as unstructured text. It all has structure. Um, first of all, it's made of letters, and then letters are made of word, make, make, make up words and, and phrases and sentences and paragraphs. And then when you get beyond that, um, those are pretty straightforward, but when you get beyond that, uh, almost all documents are of a certain size are going to have sections of some kind or another. And so what we did, we developed rules that could look across the range of different journal types of, and you know, some of them might call it an objective section. For example, one, one of the sections we use, um, some might call it an abstract, a purpose, an aim, whatever. The reality is that those sections are all pretty much the same. And the other reality is that um, once you define those, and you're, you're using you know, the text analytics capability to dynamically define them, once you do, then you can, you can use that section structure um, to weight and, and explore the different words and then documents. So the result was a faceted search application fed by text analytics, smart entity extraction, and advanced categorization. So let's take a little closer look at what that meant. Um, so for example, um, looking once you define the section, you could develop much more complex rules. So in this particular case, for example, um, what you're looking at is a rule that says, OK, if this article has these sections, and we define one section as, as abstracts, one section as methods, um, and the phrases in those sections uh, match things like all the different words for clinical trials or all the different words, words for humans, but not words that had to do with animals within five words of those clinical trial phrases. So it sounds fairly complex, but it's actually a pretty stable kind of a rule. And the point is that once you develop that rule, then you can count um, the words in those sections and, and weigh them more heavily. So what this means is you're basically developing a relevancy ranking algorithm that is way, way, way better than simple search engines counting up the number of times a search term shows up in a document, which is a pretty pathetic way to try to figure out what a document is about. This gives you much more powerful ways to figure out what a document is about. Um, another example would be where you, you, know, you find any variation of the drug name in the title. Of course, we all you know, that's easy to do. But then a variation of the drug name in the keywords and in one of these sections. Um, or you find it two times in this section, then count it as a hit and weighted heavily. So these kinds of rules, uh, particularly when, again, when you separate the, the logic from the vocabulary, these kinds of rules can be very, very stable and way more powerful um, way to, uh, to, to evaluate the relevancy um, of particular search terms. But in addition, we also had to do, we did some entity extraction as well. Um, and that actually, some, in some cases, entity extraction fed into facets. In other cases, we could use it to actually feed into the relevancy ranking um, of, of, the, of the application as well. And one of the big issues here is distinguishing between major mentions um, of something. So if you're looking through a, a scientific journal and you're looking for particular diseases, you might find dozens of diseases that are really just mentioned in passing. And so you want to throw those out. Now, mention in passing doesn't necessarily, of course, mean that they're only mentioned once where the key term is mentioned three times. No, it's way more sophisticated than that. And so you have to develop these rules that determine whether a disease is, is mentioned as a major enough um, uh, mention to, to make it into the rule. Second big piece of that was disambiguation. And for disambiguation, you need to have an, a way of analyzing, again, the context around words. So the simplest example would be um, one we all, a lot of us um, use a lot um, is the word Ford. Ford can be a company, it can be a car, it can be a person, and it can be a way to cross a stream. So the way you have to do to way what you have to do to distinguish and disambiguate which one it is in that particular text is look at the context around. It. So if there's a whole bunch of company business um, concepts around the word Ford. Then, then it's most likely it's going to be uh, for the company. Um, if there's there's um, you know, all sorts of car part kinds of terms, then it's a car. So when you do this kind of, of analysis and combine the extraction with these kinds of, of section-based rules, we and by the end of the uh, the pilot we did for them, we were actually getting close to 100% accuracy. And this is an example of how some of that might work. Um, so. 
you, you develop rules, and you, you can see over on the left, um, you've got these, these sp uh, specific words, um, but the, the words can be expressed in a lot of different ways. And then over on the right, you see actually rule-based um, uh, that is constructed by the software um, that gives you a starting point for developing your own rules. And so um, we don't have time to dive into the, the screen too much, too deeply, but basically the idea is that this is this is this is the kind of this is a standard kind of um, text analysis um, uh, development um, environment, and this is particularly good because say it does develop those those um, the base base rules, um, and it also gives you the ability not just to look for individual phrases, um, you know, individual words, but all the different variations. Um, I mean, diabetes, for example, sounds, okay, it's a simple, straightforward word. No, the reality is there's a lot of different ways um, that people use, uh, a lot of different words that people use to describe diabetes. And so the software gives you a way to organize that, classify, and then develop the rules. Um, it also gives you, this is what we mentioned, the faceted search. It gives you the ability to go in, um, create a, a good faceted search um, based on entity extraction. Um, it enables you to pull out, um, in this particular case, um, all the different um, mentions of, of gastric can cancer. And again, you can develop rules this, um, that distinguish major mentions from minor mentions. And these can be just um, combined with those facets um, that we see over on the left. OK, so what, what made this, con this project a success? The first piece was, as, as I mentioned, making using those base rules that the software starts, uh, that the software creates as a starting point. One of the big tricks in, in text analytics is how to get started. And if the software can help you get started, then you're, you're way ahead of the game. Number two was using the text analytics to utilize all the semi-structured elements that you find in documents. So instead of treating them as, as a called giant bag of words, we could use that semi-structure. Third really key part, as I mentioned, was separating the logic um, from the terms. The terms change all the time, but you don't have to change your whole um, structure every time you, um, you find a new term. Um, that, those are kept separate. They're, they're fairly straightforward, a little dictionary kind of thing. Um, so if a new term comes in, you just simply add it. You don't have to go back. You don't have to restructure things. Um, and it becomes much more of a stable. It becomes less, less what we call brittle rules, where everything um, has, everything breaks when you have new content. So if you do all, all these pieces, then smart semantic search can work. It also gives the ability to model and mine the semi-structured content, which can result in a range of new applications. And that's what we're going we're doing now um, with that company is developing those new kinds of applications um, based on top of a search engine. So um, in summary, to leave a few little bit of time for questions. Um, First of all, text analytics really should be looked at as a platform for multiple applications. I mean, if you're just interested in doing social media analysis, or you're just interested in doing enterprise search, I mean, that's fine. But the reality is text analytics really is a platform that can be used for all these uh, applications. And the way to get the most value out of text analytics is to approach it as, as a platform, not just one particular application. One of the big new directions in um, text analytics right now is the integration of text and data. Um, again, going back to the big data and big text, we're figuring out ways to combine the methods of analyzing both of them um, and um, combining enterprise content with social media content because the difference between them is blurring and blurring. Uh, and so one of the big directions is integrating all of the above. Lastly, it, or not last, but um, next, it's important to remember that Language is really messy and complex. I mean, we all learn it, but it takes years and years and years. Um, and the reality is to, to take advantage of this messy, complex thing we call language, you really need to have these kinds of text analytics tools and expertise in looking at the, the, the ability to look at context, the ability to create structures um, that power the text analytics. So what you need to succeed, what we've found in our, our work with a lot of different companies, um, in order to succeed in text analytics, you need first a strategic vision of what the text analytics can do for you and your organization. That requires a fair amount of research. But you don't want to spend too much time on research without getting direct business value, so you also need a quick win. So one way we do that um, in our, our work is um, we do this sort of three-step process and, and we create um, a, a quick win uh, as an output um, of uh, the, the analysis, the research. 
Another thing you have to do with text analytics is it really does require inter interdisciplinary skills. You need IT, business information pros. Third thing you need, and this is something that's getting better and better and better, um, is creating modules that can be reused, that can be combined in different ways. And it can be, I mean, you can, you can, one model, module, for example, might be used to just find disease states. Well, then you, once you have that working really well, you can combine it with other modules. Um, you know, the, the Watson example of the pun module for, for beating Jeopardy was, was I thought, was, was great. And one, one module was only devoted to looking for puns. Um, so when you create these kinds of, of modules, then you can develop much more intelligent, um, almost human-like um, brain. So finally then, um, success in text analytics can, uh, is, is a platform that enables you to get to use new resources, i.e. unstructured text that's sitting around doing, uh, that it's being underutilized right, right now. Uh, text analytics enables you to actually get value out of all that unstructured text. It also enables you to have new insights into tech, again, or into your, your, your business, into um, the communication by developing these kinds of rules um, that open up new avenues for uh, understanding um, what's going on inside uh, documents in new ways. And once you have that, then you have um, a whole range of new applications that can be built on top of it, like that behavior prediction. And so with that, Let's open up the questions. Um, and by the way, um, if you do have more questions, um, I have to one last little plug. Um, my book, Text Analytics, How to Conquer Information Overload and Get Real Business Value um, from Social Media, um, is as soon as we finish here today, I'll go back and, and almost finish it up. Um, it will be um, shortcoming um, in a few months um, from information today. And with that, thank you. OK, thank you very much, Tom. Um, we do have a number of questions and really, really good ones. Uh, the first one is directed at you. Can you talk a little bit about the amount of ongoing tuning and maintenance that's required for a system like the one at Beringer? Um, one assumption that's made in this questioner's place of work is that these things will run themselves. Um, and a competing assumption is that these things take too much upkeep to be worth the investment. What What is your experience, Ben? Well, that's a, that is a great question, and my experience is, again, if you approach it in the right way, um, i.e., you develop the kinds of, of um, general purpose rules um, and, and then, um, if they separate the logic of those rules from the vocabulary, you can actually um, develop rules that don't require a lot of maintenance, on the one hand, but, on the other hand, the idea that, that once you build them, they're just going to be running for years um, all by themselves um, is, is not realistic either. I mean, you do need to constantly monitor what's coming in um, in terms of the content, because the content is going to change. And, and if your rules are developed in the right way, um, they won't have to change very much. But you do have to be aware that certain expressions, and one of the nice things about text analytics is you can actually develop tools um, that are separate from the, the actual application that are just designed to do that. They're looking for new words, new usage, new patterns. I mean, uh, people start calling um, you know, a particular um, business, particularly in business, for example, like, uh, but business concept, um, the words change over time. And so you do need to monitor some, but, but if you do it right, you don't have to be um, constantly up, updating um, the rules. Um, I would add to that that you know, ontologies are a living thing. Um, as your business changes, uh, the concepts change, uh, as new advancements are made in, in, uh, in pharmaceutical research, there are going to be new concepts that, that Behringer will want to, to be tracking. So um, there's always going to be some level of, of upkeep. Um, you can't just set it up and have it run forever because it, it's essentially a representation of your business and your business does change. Um, on the other hand, as Tom says, if you do it intelligently, uh, it requires some level of effort but, uh, but not a huge level of effort. And that actually um, leads to kind of a, another question that was asked, which is how, how do you get executive support? How do you get people to realize that these things, while they may take some upkeep, are worth the investment. 
Yeah, that's that's a good question as well. Um, and the the quick glib answer is, well, you hire me and I'll I'll help you. Now, uh, I'm just kidding. Um, now, the reality is that um, text analytics is complex, um, and some parts of it are pretty straightforward um, to sell the value. Uh, that's one of the reasons social media became such a hot item. Um, being able to listen to your customers um, and what they're saying is pretty straightforwardly, obviously, a, a big win. Um, a lot of the other applications um, turn out to be more productivity gains um, and you know, Search, for example, is, is the classic example. You know, executives say, "Oh, well, somebody searches a little bit too much. So what? You know, they'll they'll just go get a cup of coffee or whatever." Um, but the reality is that um, you, what you need is to get executive support. Is again that strategic vision. What is what is Tech Analytics going to do in your organization? And the best way that I found for getting support is, as as I mentioned, is looking at Tech Analytics as a platform. Saying here's oh, here's all the things it can do, um, but on the other hand, that's pretty abstract. And so um, what we've done is, for example, we um, when we're helping a client, for example, figure out what text analytics software to buy in the first place. Um, one of the ways that we we do that is by doing, like, say, pilots, where you use the pilot to create a quick win. So they actually see a functioning application that they can understand. Um, and at the same time, if it's done well, um, not only have you created a little quick win, an application that, that you can point to, um, but you've actually also um, trained people within your organization to continue to, be, to build. And so, so that's, those are the, those, that's how we found um, it gets um, a good way to get executive support. But yeah, it's, it's something that that's it's it's not straightforward. You have to really spend some time thinking about it. Yeah, you absolutely do. Um, and I go back to these two examples, and I think that the reason that they were able to garner executive support was was very very clear. Um, in the case of Amdocs, um, the objective was to to provide tools that would help the uh, telecommunications companies reduce churn in order for them to be able to figure out exactly who was uh, uh, was threatening to cancel their account, whether they were really threatening to cancel their account or they were actually bargaining for something that they wanted, and so on and so forth. And since telecommunic com telecommunications companies measure themselves, uh, one of the industry benchmarks is the level of churn, then what they're doing is they're they're not saying we're going to create this text analytics platform. They're saying we're going to we're going to solve a problem for you around preventing churn. And in the case of Boring or Engelheim, I think uh, it, it's very similar. They actually wanted to uh, speed up the uh, the the drug development cycle, the research cycle, which you know, depending on who you read, costs anywhere from one to four billion dollars for every drug that reaches the market. Uh, they wanted to make their their scientists more effective so that they could spend more time doing their own research and less time actually reviewing other people's research. I think the the key is to have a clear business outcome that you're looking to improve. And, uh, and not just trying to, to make the data prettier. Um, there are a couple of questions here before we end that are focused on smart logic. So Tom, with your permission, I'm going to answer those. Um, one questioner has asked if um, smart, logic, smart logic has its own search engine, um, or do we work with other search engines? And the answer is smart logic does not have a search engine. It works with all of the major search engines uh, with you know out of the box integration to things like Google Search Appliance um, and Solar and so on. Uh, the objective of Smart Logic is to provide the metadata that the search engine can then use in order to be able to provide um, a much better quality user experience, and we also provide the plug the uh, plugins that will allow you to create faceted search. Uh, for example, uh, what Tom showed a couple of slides ago. Um, and the other question is, do you build the analytics in Smart Logic or do you use a different tool? Um, and the answer to that is, it depends on what kinds of analytics that you're talking about. 
if you're talking about the the analytics and the rules that you use to extract the facts that you use to classify and 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 um, and apply metadata to the information assets, then that is within smart logic. What we're finding is that a number of our customers are actually taking uh, facts from uh, the uh, uh, from their their unstructured information assets um, and importing them into other tools. Um, uh, graph databases and whatnot in the form of RDF triples in order to be able to do much more sophisticated analysis of the facts. So we are essentially providing the fodder for those other analytics tools to work. And with that, I think we have time for one last question, and that would be uh, for you, Tom. What do you think the optimal composition of staff is for a project like this? That's a very good question, and the answer, of course, is it depends. Um, <laughs> it depends on the company. It depends on um, um, the um, first application and so forth. But but um, but it gets at a deeper point, which is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, text analytics is really interdisciplinary. Um, and what I found, for example, is that um, if it's just looked at as an IT project, um, then then and it's probably not going to work very well. It's not going. To, it's going to fail um, if it's just looked at just as, as a simple business um, uh, project. Um, it's not. It's not going to work either because when you're dealing with language, it's different. And when you have, if it's like run by the library, that tends to be a little bit better. But but it, there's dangers there too with, with you know librarians that, that um, sort of think of everybody else in the world as as librarians as well. And so the reality is that what you need, you need IT people, obviously, you need business people, and you need information professionals, people that understand um, language or information structure. And w what exactly how you fill those roles, that really will depend on, on your company. Um, it might be, um, you know, for large companies, you might have, um, you know, a department of, of four or five people that are devoted to text analytics um, that includes some of the above that work with these other departments. Uh, for a small company, um, it might be, you know, one or two people um, uh, doing it. So, so it, it really varies, um, but, the, but the, the important point is that it requires communication and integration among at least those three different groups. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will add any additional questions, uh, uh, respond to any additional questions in email. I want to be respective, uh, respectful of, of everybody's time. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you hung in, even though we are, uh, in, even though we are, uh, we started a little bit late today. We will be. Um, we will be distributing uh, a PDF of the presentation materials and a link to the webinar recording after the fact. Uh, and I encourage you all to read Tom's book when it comes out. And if you have any additional questions, you can contact uh, info at smartlogic.com uh, for additional information. Thank you very much. <laughs>